a big moment for President Biden, who we just saw there. This is one of those things that presidents do that lasts well beyond uh, their time in office, decades. So let's go to President uh, Biden on another issue, another challenge that he's facing right now. That's Ukraine. We'll come back to the Supreme Court, but uh, this is a pressing issue uh, on the world agenda. Vladimir Putin uh, maybe uh, is going to be sanctioned by the United States government. That has been considered himself if Putin does indeed order an invasion of Ukraine. This new warning to Putin from the United States that he could be sanctioned comes as Russia amasses over 100,000 troops on the border, demanding that Ukraine be permanently barred from joining NATO. The Western Alliance, which includes the United States, has responded, saying these demands are simply unacceptable, that Ukraine is a sovereign nation and can join the alliance uh, if it wants. Joining us now from Kiev in Ukraine is ABC News, ABC News senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel. Once again, Ian, good to see you. Uh, thanks for being with us. Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking at the State Department on Wednesday. He confirmed that the U.S. had delivered uh, a written response now to Moscow's demands. Uh, and he spoke to the current situation in Ukraine. So let's listen to that for a second. We provided more defensive security assistance to Ukraine in the past year than in any previous year. Last week, I authorized U.S. allies, including Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, to provide U.S. origin military equipment from their inventories for use by Ukraine. Also last week, we notified Congress of our intent to deliver to Ukraine the MI-17 helicopters currently held in Defense Department inventories, five of them. So uh, that response to the Russian demands, have you got a sense of what was in it and what it means now? Ian, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Don't. Terry. Sorry, um, okay. I thought we were going to hear another clip of uh, Secretary of State Blinken. Um, yeah, yes, look, the response is basically no response. I mean, the key demand from Russia is guarantees that Ukraine will not join NATO. And Secretary of State Blinken is very clear that that demand will not be given. He said uh, every nation should be allowed to decide which alliances it belongs to, that NATO will maintain an open-door policy. In other words, if nations meet certain criteria, they want to join the alliance, then that door remains open. And that is what irks Russia. Vladimir Putin has been very clear that his red line is those guarantees. Now Secretary of State Blinken has set out, in some senses, a President Biden's red line. In other words, we're not going to give you those guarantees. Now, is there any ground in the middle? Well, he said this document, this letter, isn't a negotiating uh, proposal. However, there are areas where they can talk, for example, on, on missile treaties, on troop deployments, on, uh, sorry, not on troop deployments, but certainly on um, war games that take place on Russia's borders, something that also irks the Kremlin. But the Kremlin, again, has said that isn't what it wants. It wants these guarantees. It said not just Ukraine, but also Georgia will never join NATO. It feels it's been encroached upon. The delivery of these weapons is controversial. They see it as provocative, as aggressive action by America and by NATO, moving ever closer to the gates of Moscow. That's not how the alliance sees it. They say, look, this is purely defensive. Uh, we're not here in a threatening posture. But Nevertheless, I'm not so sure this is going to win the day. The document, the letter, whatever you want to call it, is absolutely critical because ultimately it could decide the difference between war and peace. Um, Foreign Minister Lavrov in Russia now has that letter. They're going to spend some time, I'm sure, looking at it, dissecting it, and then we'll hear the official Russian response. I think that's when it moves to this critical next stage, whether or not there will be more negotiations or whether the diplomacy is dead and everyone holds their breath to see what happens next. Well, therein lies uh, a major question, uh, ongoing diplomatic relations, uh, negotiations between the U.S. and Russia. Uh, is there any hope here to move forward? Well, interestingly, there is another track of negotiations of diplomacy, uh, and this is the, the so-called Normandy format. This involves France and Germany. They've been meeting today in Paris with representatives from Russia and Ukraine. They've just finished those talks, and they've agreed to meet again in two weeks' time. Now, that suggests on one level that, that Russia is still engaged in diplomacy, and we're looking at a fortnight before we know exactly what will go on. I guess the question is how seriously it's being taken. 
there's a reason why the Kremlin went straight to the Biden administration rather than going to the NATO alliance, rather than going to the European Union. It's America that it wants to deal with, and it's America's response that's going to count uh, uh, the most. Secretary of State Blinken is saying, look, we're open to talks. We want to carry on talking. Diplomacy isn't dead. But I think the ball is firmly in the court of Vladimir Putin now. In some senses, he put it in, in the court of the Biden administration by saying, I need this written uh, letter. I need the, to know exactly where you stand on these security guarantees. He now has that. We don't know the text. Secretary, uh, Secretary of State Blinken making clear he didn't want to reveal the contents of that, trying to keep this, some senses, uh, uh, under wraps. But now we're going to have to wait, see what the Kremlin says, see what it responds, see whether diplomacy is alive or dead. Well, and inside the, the Kremlin, Ian, you've got this massive campaign to persuade uh, the Russian people and the world of their cases. You just said that, that NATO is threatening the gates of Moscow, that, that NATO is preparing dastardly, terrible attacks, and they're, gonna, they're, they're talking about genocide. So the question is, do they really believe any of that, or, or is this not just to whip up the Russian public, uh, but uh, is this entire episode an effort to stop the democratization of those countries on Russia's border, like Ukraine. I was in Ukraine as you were, uh, you know, when, when the Maidan re revolution happened and they overthrew a Russian puppet, installed puppet in Kiev. And I wonder how much he is concerned about the spread of democracy near Russia, almost more than he is the threat of NATO. Yeah, I think that's a, good, that's a critical question. Uh, and if we all knew what was inside Vladimir Putin's head, then maybe we could all go home. I mean, uh, it, it's an issue that is being raised by lots of people. What is the true motivation? Because if you know what Putin's motivation is, then you know what the end game looks like. Um, his public popularity is down, as it was um, previously, for example, before the 2014 invasion of Crimea and the uh, essential involvement in the east of the country in the Donbass region. And at the end of it, Russian public opinion was rallied. His public opinion rating went up. Uh, so that is absolutely a consideration. Now, you mentioned these, these phrases, these arguments that are being used by officials within the Russian government, essentially trying to say, oh, well, look, the Russian speakers in Ukraine have been discriminated against. You're right, they use this, this highly um, controversial term of, of genocide. There's no evidence at all that is taking place. But similar language was used in the past, for example, in Georgia, to justify a military invention. There was the Russian speakers uh, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia who were being discriminated against, and Russia had to go in and protect them. If it's starting to make those similar arguments, in the, certainly in the east of the country where the majority do speak Russian, then that increases the chances of some kind of military action. But yes, clearly having a shining uh, example of a successful, modern, democratic country that's westward-leaning, part of the European Union, trying to be integrated into NATO, that's not what Vladimir Putin necessarily wants. He's crushed dissent within his own country. The opposition has been round, uh, rounded up, imprisoned, threatened. Even organizations, for example, that examine war crimes, uh, a, a con conduct, uh, carried out under the Stalin regime, those are being closed down as potentially anti-government threats. So everything about his posture suggests he doesn't want dissent in his own country. And if you look at his involvement in Kazakhstan, his involvement here, the suggestion is that on his borders in the old Soviet Union, he also doesn't want to see it leaning westwards and potentially causing problems at home. Stakes so high there, Ian Pennell, and we are Really happy to have you with us from Kiev, Ukraine. Thanks. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.